And if I am part of your curriculum, Adrian, that means I am in your life to facilitate your growth and transformation as well, which means that I have to be willing not to be liked. I have to be ready not to be liked. And I have to be ready to stand up in your face and tell you as it is. When I talk about love, I make a point to say that love sometimes is being willing to lose someone, being ready to lose somebody, to love them so much that you have to stand up and tell them, show them their darkness and be ready to lose them because they're probably not going to like what you have to show them. That is love. Love is not telling someone what they want to hear or being nice and, and all cuddly and all of the time. Love is fierce and love is courageous. This is Your Purposeful Life and I'm your host, Adrian Starks. I'm a speaker, podcaster, narrator, writer, and entrepreneur. On this podcast, we're taking a different approach to the understanding of purpose because it's not a one-size-fits-all. There will be a variety of guests expressing their purpose through the human mess we call the human journey. These conversations will guide you to a better awareness and understanding of your unique purpose in the daily life of mistakes, changes, and challenges and how to put that purpose into action, bringing you more experiences of success, fulfillment, and achievement on your terms. Let's go on this journey of purpose together. Welcome back, everyone, to Your Purposeful Life, and I'm your host, Adrian Starks, and it is here where we are helping you shape your purpose your kind of way. Today, I'd like to welcome on our special guest, and his name is Troy Hadid. Did I say that last name correctly? Yeah, Hadid. Hadid. All right, so to yeah. get for Troy Hadid today to our podcast and community. Troy, how are you doing today, man? What's going on? I'm good. I'm really good, Adrian. Thanks for having me, man. You know, um, today's... A good day. I think it's it's important to acknowledge that while every day is a good blessed day, not every day feels like it. And sometimes yeah. we forget, you know. Um that's, and that's right. just that's part of the human experience. And I think it's important not to just blow flowers and rainbows over everything and to acknowledge that, you know, sometimes, yeah, things don't feel all that great. But today is one of those days when everything feels really airy and cool. And yeah. I like I'm, that. And thank you for that insight, brother, because that's what we need to know. Every day is not going to be sunshine and rainbows. I know that for sure because I have tried to make them that way, Troy, and it doesn't happen that way. People will nah. rain on your parade, literally, if you let yeah. them. And it's good to know that. So today, speaking of that, we're going to talk about addressing the identity crisis with the human culture, also redefining our relationship with God and that inconvenient truth of manifestation and prayer. Before we do that, I want to make sure that our listeners today, you go ahead and download this podcast into your favorite podcast platform of choice. Go to our website, yourpurposeful.life, and it is there where you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as we will have all the full videos available there. And for my listeners, thank you for all your support and thank you for everyone else supporting the show. Back to my guest of the hour, Troy. Troy was born in Trinidad, wrote his first letter to the editor at 10 has taught yoga internationally for over 15 years and has founded several successful businesses, including a hemp store, which I must add is not a head store, okay? It's a hemp store, and a, a waste oil recycling business and a yoga studio. He has walked coast to coast across Central America, navigated the world on a ship, spent prolonged periods in silence, and is continuously seeking to make sense of the human experience. In all things, Troy hopes that his life will assist others in rediscovering a relationship with God of their understanding while inspiring people to embody more compassion, understanding, and love. I like that. Troy, thank you for being on the yeah. show today, my friend. Yeah, it's an honor. Thanks for having me, Adrian. It's great to have you. So let's talk about, let's get right into this here. You've walked coast to coast across Central America, navigated the world in a ship, and you've sat in prolonged periods of time to seek out more sense of this human experience, which I also call the human mess. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, brother, is one of the biggest issues plaguing humanity right now? Um, there's only one, Adrian, and I know it sounds like a bold statement, but at the root of everything and anything that anyone can identify that is wrong with the world we live in, at the root of it, it's one, one thing. 
And that is what I um, what I call the identity crisis. And we mm-hmm. all suffer from it. Um, even if we're aware of it, it overcomes us and, and it, we suffer from it. And that identity crisis is the understanding that my name is Troy and I am my body. Mm. And it's a narrative that we are told from the day we are born. And almost everything we experience in, the, in this human life encourages and reinforces that narrative, Adrian, that me and you are separate. Because if I am Troy and I am my body, then I am separate from everything else around me. It also means that when I leave my body, I cease to exist. And that is not a narrative I buy into. You can't, there's nothing you can do that will get me to believe that. I agree with Um, you. I don't buy into that narrative either, Troy. And I think this narrative is hard for a lot of people to understand because we have been conditioned to believe that this is who we are, this is our body, this is our family, this is our city, this is what we do for a living, and this is my value. Don't infringe on that. And when you do, or you challenge it, people get upset. So what you're saying, this is identity crisis, is also this yearning for external validation, is what a lot of people are seeking. Sure, but external validation, and of course, things like career and opinions and perspectives even even people, we get so attached that we identify with our inner circle, our opinions, as if they were who we were, so that when someone opposes an opinion, we feel like we're being personally attacked. Mm. But at the, what I want to put my finger on is this. If I am my body, and I believe that my name is Troy and I am my body, unconsciously maybe, what I'm saying is that when my body ceases to exist, I cease to exist. So what becomes our unconscious automatic way of living is that we do everything in our power to preserve our identity. My automatic go-to becomes self-preservation because I may not be conscious of it or not, but if I, if I don't have a relationship to my identity and that identity in human form overcomes me, then everything I do on some level will be governed by self-preservation. Hmm. You're right. I find that the identity the crisis we're going through is causing a lot of anger, tension, hatred, violence going on across the world right now because everyone's seeking to say, this is who I am, this is my belief system, this is what I stand for, and here comes all the opinions and judgments arising from that. Speaking of identity, Troy, let's take a trip down memory lane here to how you became who you are today. Now, Mm -hmm. you're the youngest of three brothers growing up in Trinidad, and I hear the accent, love it, by the way, wish I had an accent like that. Mm -hmm. What was life like growing up for you there in Trinidad with your siblings? Well, to be honest, Adrian, I always say I don't have massive memory of my childhood. Um, I I probe all the time to try to discover. But what I can tell you, which is really important, is this. I grew up in an extremely loving and supportive environment from my family and my brothers and my friends, even when they thought I was an absolute lunatic. They loved and supported me. Why do you think that? <laughs> well, you know, um, my, my family is quite conventional. Um, and my brothers and my dad, they run a family business. And I'm a little bit out of the box, for lack of better words. And I, I tend to kind of rattle and challenge all that is considered normal. And I have from a really young age. But I think, and I think this is important as well, to acknowledge and I own it. The reason I am able to do that is because I've always felt loved and safe. I always, it's a privilege. It's one of the greatest, forget, not forget, but when we talk about privilege, we talk about larger labels of privilege like skin color and financial success, financial wealth, opportunity, gender, sexual orientation. 
those are all important. But knowing what love and security is, growing up in an environment in which you have always felt nurtured and supported and someone has always been there to hold your hand and show you right from wrong, that is a privilege we don't talk enough about because that is the most powerful privilege of all. So, so to answer your question, Adrian, that's what I remember growing up. That's what I have to own is that I've been really blessed. And that comes with a responsibility as well, you know? I like that. And you were saying that you also were very supported in your environment and love, which is very important. There's a lot of people out there who haven't experienced that. Yeah. So, I mean, let's be honest, there's a lot of families now, their families are separated. They're not as close as they used to be. There's a lot of single parent homes going on. Nothing against that, but there's a lot of division and things yeah. that are separating kids from having that unity of a bondage of, of complete family. And what I'm getting at here is that you came from a family, and I read about you two. Your father is of, is it a middle, middle Eastern descent, and your mother is of Irish ancestry. Yeah, With those so, two combined, was it any like differences in their opinions, their belief systems, how they were raising you as a child? Did you challenge those conventions at all? Or um, I think, you know, I think when, when, my dad, my mom and dad got married. They got married at like pretty late, I think, in their lives. And at that point, most of the Arab community in Trinidad, they married within their community. So I think my dad, from what I understand, was one of the first to kind of challenge that and go outside of that. What I can say is... I won't, I won't say there was conflict, but there was a lot that my mom, I think, challenged around Arab culture. And I remember a story of my mom going back to Syria with my dad. He was born in Trinidad, but his parents were born in Syria. So they went back to the village in Syria. And in Syria, all the women were in the kitchen while the men played cards and drank or whatever. And my mom was like, no way. She's like, I'm going to drink and I'm going to play cards. You know, I'm going to hang with the men. And I remember that story. So I think my, my, my having parents from two different cultures also gave me, contributed so much to who I am today, you know? I like that. Two different cultures. And I love how your mom was like, we're not doing that. Mm -mm. That's like my mom. My mom is the same yeah. way. Very strong, very, very independent. But at the same time, there was still unity within the household. There wasn't anyone trying to undermine the other or trying to do what we call the power trip. It was a yeah. partnership of we're both together. Let's work on our strengths to, you know, and, and be stronger and we'll help ourselves improve our weaknesses. Speaking of yeah. you know, challenging conventional way of thinking that your father did, and also you being kind of this outlier in your family, you had some influences that came into your life that's sparking this person that you are today. What influence from, I would say, not the religious view, but outside the religious view that you think that really had an impact on how spiritually you are today as a person? Um, I think Rastafari and reggae mm. culture, and okay. this amazing individual we know it's Bob Marley. I Bob think Marley. That is yeah, that Love entire it. culture, right? I used to have really long hair, by the way, Adrian. May not look like it now. <laughs> but back in the day before I was overcome with my genetical condition of bowling. Um, but reggae and Rastafari culture had a massive influence on my life. And when most people say that, especially most adolescent people, you initially think that um, that comes with the smoking of mar mar marijuana and the smoking of herb and the cool factor that comes with all of that. Well, I was never into that. Hmm. I always viewed herb as a sacrament hmm. through, through this lens of, of Rastafari. And that is one of the reasons I never became a habitual smoker of marijuana. I was hmm. never against it. But I saw it through a different lens. I never saw it as a social thing to do. It was something that should be done in ritual and prayer. But what I can tell you is this. This word privilege comes up again because it's important for me, right? I also grew up 
in a very com- financially comfortable household and a very up, upscale neighborhood. And what reggae music did for me, what reggae culture did for me was expose me to reality outside of my bubble. There we go. Right? And how I talk about privilege, Adrian, is this. I think, you know, privilege is almost a bad word. And when I was younger, it was a bad word. I didn't want to tell people my name. I didn't want to tell people where, my, where I lived. Because I didn't, personally, I did not want to be seen as different or other or stush or spoiled. I wanted to be part of the collective of everyone else. And there was a lot of shame around my privilege. Back then, I only saw a larger labels of privilege, right? Which are really money and race. I didn't really have the presence of mind to acknowledge all the other aspects of privilege. But here's the thing about privilege. Privilege is just an advantage. Mm-hmm. And we all have privileges. Mm-hmm. And if we don't own our privilege, then it owns us. Whoa. Then, then that means our privilege doesn't benefit anyone else but us and our inner circles. Mm. But if we can acknowledge that privilege is not a bad thing, no one chose to be born into certain circumstances, then we see privilege as somewhat of a gift, but it comes with responsibility. Because when we acknowledge our privilege, With that, if we're really paying attention, it comes with a responsibility to dissolve the very circumstances that created our privilege in the first place. It comes with a responsibility to save something bigger, right? Mm -hmm. So I think for me, the influence of reggae and Rastafarian culture, along with the influences and understanding of the teachings of Christ outside of organized religion, molded me to understand that I had a responsibility to save something bigger than myself. The purpose. The purpose behind things. And I and I like that. And when I think of Bob Marley, I think of sun is shining, the weather is sweet. I can't really sing it like he can, but that's popping yeah. in my head right now. And back to you were saying how you had the dreads and everything. And here's what I believe. You know, people may laugh at me of saying this though. I think truthfully I've been researching this. Every person, particularly men in general, who have very strong thoughts and they're connected to this higher source, if you Mm -hmm. notice, they don't have much hair on their head. So this is my philosophy. The thoughts are so powerful, they're burning through the skull. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) If you think about that, but that's just my my take on that. But anyway, I want to get back to this idea of, like you were saying, privilege. And I like how you Mm -hmm. said that the Rastafarian music allows you to see things outside your bubble. But your life wasn't always perfect. Yes, you had a great loving family, but you also, like most people, younger people, you got into some trouble here and there. And I think there was a moment where you got into detention, as most kids would do. And there is this teacher that gave you a special book that helped change that perspective for you. So I want to go to this story here. First Mm -hmm. off, Troy. Why did you get into detention? What happened? Well, and to I, this teacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this is a really funny story, Adrian, really special story. But, um, you know, I didn't, I, I remember this teacher, you know, for the last 15, 20 years I've been teaching yoga. People ask, well, how do you get into yoga? And I always reference this teacher, Mr. Gayadi. And I said, well, he was, I think, of the word Y-O-G-A, yoga, in that context, he was definitely, I think, my first influence. And I remember going up every lunchtime in high school. I went to boys' high school, and every lunchtime, I would give up my lunchtime, and I would go and sit with him and read these books. Mm-hmm. And all these books were of Eastern tradition and Eastern spiritual context. And I always said that I wish one day I could meet Mr. Gayadeen again. I haven't seen him since 1994. To tell him what, how he may have possibly influenced my life. So a few years ago, I get this comment in my email, right, from my website, which usually goes to junk because they're usually all spam, most of them. 
But this one found its way through, and it said, I think I give you practice of brahmacharya to read in 1994, Fatima College, S. Gayadeen. And I was like, no way. <laughs> so I replied to him, and I got it. I, I, I just spilled it all out in email, and I got his phone number, and I called him. And that's when the first thing he said is, Troy, listen. I want to get your story straight because you were first sent to detention. He said, that's how you ended up in my room. I didn't remember that. (laughs) I remember being a good kid, you know. But he said, you were sent to detention. And he explains to me that when I came to detention, he gave me that book to read as a joke. He said, I don't even do yoga. I'm not Hindu. I have no relationship to yoga whatsoever. All I knew was this was a text about sexual conduct and misconduct. And why not give a 14-year-old boy that to read? And um, he said, I sat down there and I devoured it. And after that, every lunchtime, I came up to see him of my own free will. I went to detention of my own free will to read more books and read more books and read more books. And what's funny about that story as well is that he says, Troy, I now teach yoga. I now teach in Ontario, Canada. And I've been talking about you for the last 20 years. He says, how, 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 look at that synchronicity. You've been speaking about me, and I've been speaking about you, but we haven't said a word to one another since 1994. And he said, how he found me that day is he was again talking to his class. I think he said, eighth graders. I don't know if that's a thing. Um, and he, he was telling them this story about his 14 year old kid called Troy Hadid who impressed him with his reading and commitment to study these books of his own free will. And his class Googled my name. And when they Googled my name, that's when they were like, do you know he's now an international yoga teacher? And um, that's, he, he had no idea. And that's how he found me and he reached out. What a, an amazing story. And I'm so glad you shared that with us. The fact that you didn't even know that your first encounter with him was because of detention and he gave you the book as a joke. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Like why that book? But I think I know why that book was meant for you. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't think there's any coincidence. Yeah. I don't think there's any coincidence that he just gave you a book. And then that happened to be the thing that you, you have the path of life on. I think it was perfect yeah. timing. Are you still, are you guys going to work together in coordination? Are you going to come to one of his classes and speak or help him with something Regarding Man, the kids. I would love to. We are in touch. We do stay in touch every now and again. And I'm probably going to message him today, actually. But funny enough, he came about a year or two ago. He came back to Trinidad. And he went to my yoga studio, but I wasn't there. So um, oh. he at least got to stand <laughs> up there and see it and be in it and um, feel a little bit of what he had a hand in, you know? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's very proud of you. I mean, such an incredible journey that you've been on. And speaking of this journey of being an international yoga instructor, there's people that have conceptions about what yoga is actually. And there's yeah. a, a misunderstanding of it, especially since it's been commercialized quite a bit. Yeah. Can you tell us what yoga means to you in the sense of what you've discovered over time and how you're using that to teach people? Yeah. Yoga to me is way beyond asana way beyond postures. You know, in the West, we think yoga, all these postures we do. Even to some people, we, we have yoga practices that are meditation or breath work or chanting or scriptures or all this stuff. And all of it is beautiful. And all of it is really useful. But it's also meaningless. Because what I've discovered, Adrian, is at the very foundation of yoga practice is our realization of union with God. That is the essence of you. And what we do on our yoga mats or our meditation cushions, that is just a practice for the real practice. The real practice of yoga is how we live our lives. 
It's the ability to really see divinity and see God in all things and everyone and then to act and live accordingly. And for me, one of the greatest yogis that has ever walked the planet is a man called Jesus. Mm -hmm. He was, he's one of my teachers, right? Now, there are many others. Mine too, yeah. But, but he's one of mine. And that, that embodiment of love, that understanding that we are not our physical bodies and the, the commitment to love beyond our personal desires and needs, beyond our own self-preservation, to be able to see God even in the darkest aspects of our society. That is yoga. Beautiful. I love how you brought Jesus up. For the listeners today that are chiming in, we're not talking about religion, organized religion here. We're talking on a, on a, deep, on a different level of awareness of connection of all things around us. Joy, I want to take you back to the beginning of the conversation where you mentioned to us about the identity crisis. I am yeah. my name, I am my body. And this plays full factor here when you're talking about this connection through yoga, through the divinity of all things, that we are not separate from it, that we are truly connected. This is very powerful. But when you say we are far more connected than we could ever imagine to things around us, to the higher power, what do you mean by that? Because some people are going to be like, okay, you say I'm connected to a tree. I'm connected to this. What do you mean by that? Oh, wow. Um... So one of the most profound um, moments, I think, in my practice and teaching of yoga, well, more my practice, that's where we discover things like that. But I began to practice in a way that was very slow and long and graceful and to move my body in a way that was very prayer-like, a way that can be described as intimate, that is, in doing my yoga practice. And the more I began to extend my breath and really just be with my breath, I began to feel that this practice was a form of prayer. And I began to feel very connected to God, to source, whatever you want to call God. And I then learned how breath actually worked. I was 27 years old and I learned how to breathe. Three years after teaching yoga. Because I know most of us have been walking around breathing for decades. That doesn't mean we know how to breathe. And to be in relationship to breath is very powerful. And I'll just tap on that. Is that when we breathe, we don't pull air into our body. That's not how breath works. It's a vacuum. We create space in our body by expanding the ribcage and the diaphragm, the sends and the chest and the back body should expand. So when we increase the volume of our body, the air pressure inside of us decreases. What this means now is the air pressure outside of us is higher than the air pressure inside of us. So air moves inside of us. We don't pull it. We create space to receive breath. We don't pull breath into us, right? So what I like to explain is that we are not actually breathing. We are creating space to be breathed by an external force. I've never heard that before. Whoa. And the same, but it's true. Powerful. Right? And the same Powerful. force breathing me, Adrian, it's the same force breathing you. And I'm not even done there. So I'm going to put a pin in it by this. Shortly after I learned the anatomy of breath, Something maybe I was reading or listening to or whatever brought me to Google the word spirit. And when I looked up the word spirit, it comes from the Latin word spiritus. And it means to breathe. And it all just really made sense to me. Like it makes sense. Breath is the one thing that connects every living an inanimate object on the planet, the air we breathe, is like a plasma that holds us. And through my relationship to breath, you know, I'm careful when I say this because I don't like sounding like some mumbo jumbo <laughs> kind of esoteric dude because I'm not. But I do believe that breath carries divine intelligence and that if we can connect and create time to deepen our relationship to breath. It deepens our relationship to spirit or God or whatever you want to call it. 
And that is one of the ways in which spirit communicates to each one of us. But the breath, you know, we talk about DNA, Adrian. We talk about DNA. We talk about ancestry. We talk about opinions. We talk about all these things that categorize us, even though they, they connect us. Well, nothing connects us more than the air we breathe. Mm. It is the one thing that unites everything and makes us all the same. So it only makes sense to me. I'm just in, in awe about this whole interpretation of spirit and how the divine being is breathing us and we're just allowing space for it in our body. And when we allow for space, then we connect with it further, which is interesting because when we're born, babies, they breathe that way. They already come to this planet knowing that they are part of the divine intelligence. Yeah. But what happens to us, like you said, this identity crisis, we start breathing differently. For the listeners today, when you're breathing, think about where your stomach is going. When you inhale, what happens to your stomach? When you exhale, it's just the opposite of what Troy said. Because when we're breathing, society has kind of conditioned us to think that we have to keep our stomachs tight fit in. That way we look the part. We look, we look like we're fit. So we don't want our stomachs to expand out. And so we breathe just the opposite. And we wonder why we have stress, why there's things going on in our body that's off center. And what you have done, Troy, today is you've, sh- well, you've explained to us the correction of how to breathe. Now, this connection that we're having is perfect. Do you have any perspectives? So now we're talking about being a part of this divine intelligence, which mm-hmm. for everyone listening today, however you want to call it, Whatever name you've been accustomed to listen, to learning about it, that's fine. We're not saying anything different about how you believe that divine intelligence to be for you. What we're saying is that how to connect with it better so you can prevent this identity crisis of feeling so disconnected from everything. Troy, do you have any perspectives on hope and faith that might help individuals navigate today's world? Because they are feeling separated. They are yeah. feeling like they're at war with themselves and possibly everyone else out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll, I can be really direct with this. Um, hope is actually an absence of faith. You know, okay. we, 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 of faith. We, we often put hope and faith in the same category, and they're not even close. They may be on the same team, but they're not even close. Hope creates space for uncertainty. It creates space for doubt. Wow. It is an absolute absence of faith. Faith is a knowing, right? Now, I want to be clear. Faith does not belong to religion. Okay. Right? At all. all. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, neither does God. God and faith first actually came long before religion did. And even, I would even go as far to say that we had to have faith to start to understand God. Now, I we, want to interject here just a little bit because I like to play both sides of the coin here. Yeah. There's going to be someone that's going to challenge it and say, well, how do you say God comes before religion when all we've been taught about our whole life is about God and religion and how that plays a factor? So, what we're, so what's happening is that you're saying that this God, so what we have been used to seeing God as is this physical image that is somewhere, don't know where it is for you, but it's somewhere, and it's possibly going to get mad at you for something, or there's some kind of repercussions for doing something a certain way. And this is, this is the God that we have to be very careful about, because when you're thinking, I want you to think outside the box like Troy says, because you're going to build some resistance here. You're yeah. going to start tuning out. So I want to just kindly interject there to let people know that you're not saying anything against their God. What you're no. saying is that this existence of a higher power happened way before we attached an image to it. So yeah. go, you can go ahead, Troy. An uh, image or, or any kind of religion or construct, right? And this is not an attack on organized religion. So I want to make that clear. I'm not in any way attacking organized religion. I think religion is a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a lot we yes. can talk about the misalignment within religion and historically yes. wrongs that have been done in the name of religion, which I believe it's important to acknowledge. But it's really simple. We didn't form a religion and then said, let's create a God. That's not how it went down. 
<laughs> someone understood and had could feel that they were part of something greater, that there was a large intelligence, and then they gave a name to that large intelligence. Some people called it God. There were a lot of other names before God, right? Before we called it God. But what faith is, is an understanding that we are part of a larger intelligence and that we are being held and cared for. So hope, let me draw an example. I can hope that nothing bad will happen to me today or nothing uncomfortable. But if something uncomfortable or bad does, then I'm going to feel defeated and my hopes are going to be crushed. If I live my life with faith and something negative or bad or uncomfortable happens to me today, then I understand that that is part of a larger curriculum, that this is something I need to experience in order to facilitate either my own growth and transformation or even someone else's. So, wow. so I have faith in the larger intelligence that surrounds everyone. So it's a lot easier to get up and go again. It's almost impossible for faith to be crushed. Faith might have a hard time, but faith understands that there's an intelligence that dreams bigger than we do. Wow. It reminds me of the quote from Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and say that faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. One of the most Ab powerful quotes on faith ever, right? Yeah, absolutely. And One step at a time. It's just the knowledge of knowing if you can quiet your mind and be present, there is an intelligence that communi communicates to you. If you have that courage to take that first step, like Dr. Martin Luther King said, just take that next step. And that's all you need to know. That next step. That next step. Powerful. Yeah. Speaking of next step, let's step into this next question here. Do you believe in manifestation and the power of thought? We're talking about just wrapped up faith now. This, yeah. this perspective of believing that no matter what, you're connected to the source. No matter what happens, the source is with you. If you just connect with it and things, you can work through things. What about the manifestation? and the power of thought. Because there's a lot of people out here who have been told or conditioned to believe that, oh, if I just think lofty, good thoughts, life yeah. is going to be grand for me. If I just manifest this image over here that I, I'm going to have this, I'm going to have it. And this is why I think a lot of people are lost today because those things are not happening for them. So is this, does this work? Do you believe in that manifestation and power of thought? And if you do, what do you think people are doing wrong if things are not coming true for them or reality for them? Yeah, um, this is a big one, um, Adrian. So much so that if listeners are on board, I would tell you whatever you're doing, stop doing and pay attention. All right. Um, if you go. don't want your life to be changed, you should probably turn off this podcast because it's about to get real. All and. Right. You know, we ask, we ask questions in the exact perfect way, right, today. So manifestation to me is just a new age name for the word prayer. That's all manifestation is, is prayer. We just made it more digestible, mm. yeah? Now, yeah. if my breath is spirit, I'll tell you how that relates to me. If there is an essence or divine agency of any kind in any aspect that is moving through me, then prayer is not something we do. Prayer is something we are. Manifestation is not something we do. We are living embodiments of manifestation and prayer. Hmm. Now, somebody might say, wow, that sounds beautiful. I'm going to use that. I'm not done. <laughs> because it's easy to say, I'm going to pray 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the afternoon. It's easy to say, I pray when I go to church or mosque or temple. It's easy to say, I'm going to manifest every night when I sit down with my journal or when I wake up in the morning. But what about all the other time? 
we are constantly praying and constantly manifesting, but we are doing so unconsciously. Every word, every thought, every action is prayer and manifestation, mm. which means now that that comes with a responsibility to bring more awareness and intention to how we live our lives. Because every time I am greedy, I contribute towards greed in our world. I pray for greed. Every time I'm selfish, I pray that people are more selfish. That's what I'm doing. Every time I raise my voice in aggression, I am creating a reality in which people are more aggressive and more vocal. This brings immense power to all of our words, our actions, and our thoughts. We cannot conveniently choose what is prayer and manifestation and what is not. Everything is. And that comes with a huge responsibility to begin to live our lives with a lot more intention and take accountability for the areas of our life in which we actually contribute negatively. Hmm. Okay. So I'm, I'm, there was a lot of notes dropped there and I am listening. The questions I have going through my head are questions I have to ask myself. And for our listeners today, reach out to me. Let me know what questions you have about what Troy just said here. And then I can connect with Troy and we can communicate with you and find some other ways of expressing, explaining things for you. What you're saying is this responsibility of us. So once again, I'm going to jump on the other side here because I know there's people are probably thinking something very differently. We're responsible for the things that are happening in our lives. Manifestations are constantly occurring because we have unconscious thoughts and beliefs that basically could be social conditioning that we're operating from and we don't even know it. And this is the whole idea of what you were saying, this identity crisis, that we have to be very clear and intentional about what we're wanting to do in our lives and what we're wanting to experience by understanding ourselves and getting out of this pocket of the box way of thinking. When someone, when you just said earlier, let's just say someone comes over and they want to take advantage of your business, yeah. right? And you, have, and you know that, that something is happening and you do not like it. Yeah. And you confront this person because you know that they're, they don't mean well. Now, for some people, that would mean like, yeah, you put them in their place. You tell them that. That's, you know. So is it still okay to do that? But if we do that, is that still putting out that energy of being taken advantage of? Great question. I'm so glad you asked that, Adrian, because um, you know what's funny is that we've dressed up love and compassion and empathy in all this flowery rabbits and butterflies and lollipops and rainbows and stuff. <laughs> love is fierce. Like, love is fierce. For me, fierce. The, the absolute, get this, the absolute embodiment and representation of love for me was Christ. It's Jesus. He was a rebel. He yeah, he was. was. A, he was a rebel. He rocked social norms. He was up in people's face. So what I would say is this. Remember, we are not our bodies, which means what we are, spirit walking around in human form with certain conditionings and experiences. Every individual, every individual, they're just a bag of conditioning, a bag of experiences. So I'm not saying that when someone we come into conflict or we're being taken advantage of, that we don't stand up for ourselves. Absolutely, we have to. We must stand up for ourselves. We avoid violence at all costs. And rather than seeing someone in conflict as being on a separate team, we acknowledge that we are not separate. We are not separate. But we are now part of one another's curriculum. And if I am part of your curriculum, Adrian, that means I am in your life to facilitate your growth and transformation as well. Which means that I have to be willing not to be liked. I have to be ready not to be liked. And I have to be ready to stand up in your face and tell you as it is. When I talk about love, I make a point to say that. Love sometimes is being willing to lose someone, being ready to lose somebody. To love them so much 
that you have to stand up and tell them, show them their darkness and be ready to lose them because they're probably not going to like what you have to show them. That is love. Love is not telling someone what they want to hear or being nice and, and all cuddly and all of the time. Love is fierce and love is courageous. And I think it's really important that we, um, we note that. But at the same time, remember, it's not personal. That individual that you are up against, that conflict, that experience, that's not really them. That's just their conditioning. Mm, and, like um, you know, I have a, a quote that I tattooed on my arm here, Adrian, and I, I wish I, I learned of it decades ago. And I don't even know who the author is because I can't find out. It always comes up as unknown. But it says this. It's a reminder. It says, I have not come to teach. I have come to love. And love will teach. Mm. Love is a teacher. Love is in all with flowers and rainbows. I like how you said love is fierce and love is courageous. Woo, I have not heard someone say that in a, in, at all about love because we have been taught love is an altruistic state. You yeah. self-sacrifice in order to show love for people. And let me tell you, Troy, I've gotten in so much trouble doing that. Being that sacrificial lamb for people, yeah, giving everything away in order and hopes that they would love me the same way that I love them. And I learned my lesson. Self-love is powerful, but it's not selfish. It's, being, it's just self-love. And you can only give what you have for yourself. I like how you put love into the state of power, of not just being weak, but it's a powerful force. And back to Jesus, he was a rebel. I mean, look at this guy. He had disciples that were fishermen. You think they walked around talking about roses and rainbows? <laughs> they probably yeah. had some interesting conversations. Yeah. He chose some of the toughest people out there because he knew what he was up against. But at the same time, he's deemed through history, and it's back to that conditioning again, as this person who's just, he just loved, that was it. He just loved, love everybody, love yourselves. And that's what I was taught growing up until I started doing my research, started learning a little bit about yeah. the history behind things and realize that, no, love is, like you said, love is taking the courage to tell someone something they need that you, they need to hear, not what, yeah. not, you know, not what you want them to, to hear. I mean, they need to know it. So back to this idea of love and what you're doing with yoga, there's another side of you I want to jump into right quick here. You wrote a book and it's called yeah. Popcorn in My Pocket. Can you yeah. explain <laughs> the title? <laughs> I love it. It's catchy. Yeah. I was like, what? I need to talk to you about this. So, yeah, yeah, where did that come from? Yeah, you know what's really funny, Adrian? It's yesterday. Um, right now it's with our final, the final editor. And um, I got a call yesterday and they're like, um, how do you feel about changing the name of this book? <laughs> and I was like, what? Um, but I do understand. So the name of the book may very well change. Um, and the reason is that the editor found that the content of the book was so moving and so powerful and so life-altering that they felt the name didn't really do it justice. The name was a little flowery and playful um, and didn't really say, give the essence of the book. But I will answer your question why I named the book Popcorn in My Pocket, because I think it's also relevant, right? Okay. One, I put my hand in my pocket at 20 years old, a week after movies, and I discovered old popcorn. This is a true story. And I put that popcorn in my pocket, ate it a week later, and I actually said the words, popcorn in my pocket would be the name of my first book. Turns out it <laughs> might not, but... <laughs> It got me this far, so it had its purpose. Um, but to answer your question, the analogy I use in the book is this. I use popcorn as a symbol of all the spiritual teachings and epiphanies and insights that we come to or search for in our life. The pocket is a spiritual pocket, and every individual has their own spiritual pocket. But what I see happening in the world is that we live in a world that is filled with popcorn. 
and everyone is throwing popcorn around. We read a book, we talk about it, we listen to podcasts, we talk about it, we share posts on social media, and we're just tossing all this popcorn around. (laughs) But we're not understanding it. Mm. And we're not asking this question. This is a really good question. We, we look at our lives and we like to look for areas in our life in which we embody these teachings. We're not asking a question, where do I not embody this? Mm. And that is a fundamental question. If a teaching is love, we can't just look at the areas of our life in which we represent and embody love. If we're committed to growth and transformation, we have to look at the areas of our lives in which we don't. And we need to take this popcorn and put it in our pockets so that we really understand it and it becomes our own. Mm -hmm. So in this book, I share teachings and insights and stories from my life in which have brought me to, to closer to understanding these teachings. And rather than the reader simply adopting them and regurgitating them and posting them, I encourage the reader to adopt them and see where does this apply to your life? Where are you disconnected from this? You know? Love that. I love that. And I hope, I want you to stay with the title. I think the title is very catchy. I like it. I mean, I'm sure yeah. that they're going to, you have to talk to them about that, but yeah, I like the title, but in all honesty, the popcorn in my pocket, I totally got it, understood it when you just mentioned it to me. And I love that. It reminds me of the idea of knowledge. People talk about knowledge being power, but here's the thing. Knowledge is just knowledge. And right now we have way too much information that's floating around. Yeah. And the problem with a lot of people is that their knowledge is not being applied in directions of their lives that yeah. make it meaningful and purposeful. And that's why there's so much information and no one knows what to do with it. So I like your concept of challenging that saying, what are you not applying? Yeah. Why not? Like, what's going on here? And then that opens up that door of thinking about the information that you have instead of just saying, oh, I got popcorn here. I'm just going to toss it to the next person. And yeah. that to me is, is very powerful. Now, I want our audience to definitely be up to date on this book when it's released. And I also want them to have a way of connecting with you to learn more about what you're doing around the world with your teachings. How do they reach out to you to do that? Troyhadi.com is my website. And um, I would highly encourage anyone to go there and sign up for newsletter. They actually get some free yoga classes online and that kind of stuff when they sign up. (laughs) I'm also pretty active on Instagram. So I would highly um, encourage people to reach out to me there, follow me, click, share, post, whatever you see. Um, One of the the most disappointing things about the literary world, um, Adrian, is... I've I've been going out to publishers and agents. I've gotten such amazing feedback about this book. Um, they love your writing, they love your content, they love your teachings, but your social media following isn't big enough. <laughs> you know, so um, it's unfortunate that it's come to that, while I do understand it from a business point of view. So I would just love to encourage people if they do connect to what they hear, they do want to reach out. I even work with people one-on-one and do privates and so on. So um, I'm here and I would love and appreciate any support and any encouragement. I'll make sure I put all those links in the show notes of this podcast to the audience today. Go and follow, support Troy on his quest. We need more people like this out in the world. And you just already said, you know, he's got great material. And a lot of times we live in a world right now, I'm just going to say this, everything is driven by social media. And that day will come where you'll have people like Troy that will be out in the forefront and social media is not going to matter. Right now, we are in that time right now, but I would say that do not just go to someone's social media page and say, oh, they only have X amount of followers. I'm not going to follow them. I'm not going to listen to what they have to say. Look at their content, connect with Troy, and find out more about what he's doing and learn some yoga. It's free. Come on now. Yeah. All right, Troy. <laughs> one last question for I like to ask for all my guests, my friend. What does living a purposeful life mean to you? Whoa, how long do we have left? <laughs> you know what? We got as much time as you need. I mean, that's that's my ending question. I've got to know. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll make it really simple. And I actually heard this from... Another teacher's name is Tommy Rosen, but I had this experience with him um, in India. So I'm going to pass it on to your listeners. And 
The purpose of your listeners right now and yourself, Adrian, is to listen to me speak. And I know that sounds cocky and egotistical, but when you speak, that is my purpose, to listen to you speak. And I think our purpose, we sometimes think of purpose as this big, grand idea or dream. Mm. But like Martin Luther King implied, your purpose is in your next step. So you better be paying attention. If not, you're going to miss it. And our purpose is to live in every moment with as much intention and presence as possible. Because if we don't, the voice of the mind is going to vo drown out the voice of God. Because the mind is always taking us into the future. It's always taking us into the past. The mind doesn't want us to be present. It's screaming and shouting all of the time. But if we can create this relationship with the mind and learn to live in a moment, that's when we discover what a purposeful life is. Well said. Wow. Troy, it has been an amazing time to have you on the show today, brother. You have been absolutely a gem. Thank you for all that you brought to the show, energetically wise, wisdom, everything. Thank you, Adrian. It's an honor to be here, and I feel the same. And you could call on me at any point in time. I'll drop everything I'm doing, and I'll be back with you. Thank you for listening to Your Purposeful Life today, and I'm your host, Adrian Starks. Download this podcast on any platform of your choice by going to our website, yourpurposeful.life. Join me on my social media channels and be a part of the Your Purposeful Life community. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that like button with a purpose. Let's help you shape your purpose your way.